It really is a blessing and a great encouragement to be among so many people who appreciate worshipping in the way that we have been worshipping today. And uh, people who obviously belong to churches where the Word of God is central in that worship. And you don't need me to tell you that we are living in days when that is something that is diminishing, I think, in this country as well, certainly in the United Kingdom. And I know that a number of you here are pastors, and we've been looking at the great pastor of his people, our Lord Jesus Christ. But I would like to recommend to those of you who are pastors, and maybe those of you who are not, there is a small booklet by the Reverend William Still of Aberdeen. I think William Still's letters are available in the bookstore. But uh, William Still wrote a small booklet entitled The Work of the Pastor. And in it, he makes this comment that has lived with me for a long time. And I feel that it sums up the need of the hour. William Still says that the pastor's responsibility is to feed the sheep, not to entertain the goats. Let the goats entertain goats, and let them do it in Goatland. But you will never turn goats into sheep by pandering to their goatishness. And we're living in days when men are beginning to pander to the goatishness of those who are not believers. And the best way for people to become Christians who are not Christians is for them to find themselves in the place where Christians are being fed on the Word of God, the whole Word of God, and the whole counsel of God. So don't pander to the goatishness of unbelievers seeking to adapt your worship and your message so that it will accommodate those who are in the world. Well, having said that, I'll probably get a few questions afterwards about it. Um, <laughs> Let me invite you to turn with me to the 23rd Psalm that we are considering together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, we've already seen in our studies in this psalm that it is not a prayer, that it is a statement of faith, and that statement is given to you in that one brief but clear affirmation in the opening verse, the Lord is my shepherd, and then you have the inference from that I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. That's the statement of faith. The inference from that statement of faith, I shall not want. And then that inference is drawn throughout the rest of the psalm. And David uses a number of swift statements in demonstrating the inference. And in verse 2, he gives the picture of rest and of renewal as the shepherd makes the sheep to lie down in green pastures and makes them to drink from the still waters, beautifully calm, peaceful, pastoral scene. Now, it's at this point that we need to keep the wider picture, the panorama before us. Repose and refreshment are designed to prepare us for the onward journey and the difficult tasks and the hardships that lie ahead of us. You could take the analogy even further to its logical, biblical conclusion, why does the shepherd possess sheep? 
Why does the shepherd guard the sheep? Why does he guide the sheep? Why does he protect the sheep? Why does he feed the sheep? Why does he restore the sheep? So that ultimately, the life of the sheep will be taken and the life will be sheep, of the sheep will be presented as a, and accepted as an offering and as a sweet-smelling sacrifice. Or if you wish to change the metaphor, it is the corn of wheat which must fall into the ground and die in order that it might bring forth much fruit. Now, as you come to the third verse, you're given another inference from the opening statement. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. So here is the corrective to the idea that the Christian life is all green pastures and still waters. There are times of shadow, there are times of sorrow, there are times of warfare, there are times of conflict. So he needs to restore my soul. And I believe that literally in the Hebrew, it means that he brings it back. It's been translated in a number of ways. He refreshes my soul or he revives my soul. And it conveys the idea of restoration to a forsaken path. It means bringing the sheep back either from its errors or from its wandering. It's the same verb that you find in Isaiah 58 verse 12, verse 12 where the Lord describes himself as the restorer of paths or of cities to dwell in. It's also used in Isaiah 49, 5. The Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring back Jacob to him. So it's another pastoral picture of the shepherd going out after the straying sheep and he brings it back into the flock from which it has been wandering and he refreshes it and he restores it. And I suppose the outstanding illustration of that is to be found in Luke 15 in the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin and the lost son. And so the idea is that of a restoration to a path which has been forsaken and then of being given strength to walk in that path once again. So here is David looking back over his life and he sees that again and again the Lord has restored him when he has wandered away. So it is this aspect of the Lord's dealings with him that David is now bringing before us. And one commentator says that this is the medical string in the harp, the shepherding that is the shepherd showing his healing powers. He restores my soul. Now, that statement in verse 3 suggests a number of important spiritual truths. And first of all, it reminds us of the fundamental relationship between the sheep and the shepherd. What is the normal relationship between sheep and shepherd? It is that of nearness and of union. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They follow me. A stranger will they not follow for they know not the voice of strangers. So the statement that David is making here suggests that the sheep had gone astray. The shepherd brings it back to the place which it ought not to have left. So what is the true position of every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? It is that of a sheep abiding close to the shepherd. It is union and it is communion. And that is the whole basis of our Christian salvation. We have come to know the Lord not just to know about him, but we have come to know him. We are in union with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's something that we need to grasp more and more as believers if we want to be guarded against spiritual despondency. We are united to Christ. Now keep in mind that this statement is the inference from the basic assertion in verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. And now he is saying, he restores my soul. The glorious gift and privilege of salvation is to be brought into this eternal union and this constant communion with Christ. And it's not a privilege that we enjoy occasionally, 
at special services or at special conferences or on certain days. Paul didn't say, for me, on Sundays is to rejoice in Christ. He said, for me, to live all my life is Christ. So this fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ is our experience here on earth, as well as our hope for what it will be in heaven. It's not a luxury for certain special days or certain Sabbaths. It is the provision for our everyday life. His word to us for all seasons of our life is that you are to abide in me. And we should strive with all of our hearts to abide in Christ, so that by day and by night, as well as weekends, in joy and in sorrow, we must walk close to Christ, abide in Christ. That is the fundamental and basic relationship for all believers. You've been brought into the fold of God. You must seek to stay as close to the shepherd as you possibly can. We must endeavor to be like Mary, who was found sitting at the master's feet. Now, in John chapter 15, our Lord has described that relationship to him as that of friends. Now, if we are friends, we need to demonstrate that friendship to him by being friendly. He that would have friends must show himself friendly. But how can that be called a friendship if the friends never see each other or they never speak to each other? Where is the friendship if in the course of a week we never converse with our friend? If we never have time either at home or in work when we speak to our friend? when we interact with our friend? Is it a demonstration of kindness to somebody who is supposed to be our friend that we never commune with them? That we never spend time with them? Did Jonathan treat David as his friend in that way? But the scripture also teaches us that we are more than friends to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are his brethren. And you remember the statement given by our Lord. Behold, he said, my mother and my brethren, whoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. So ask yourself the question, is it a brotherly act to act towards a brother as if he was a stranger or as if he was a foreigner and you never exchange words with your brother? And there is a deeper and more fundamental relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ than even a friend or a brother. Our Lord described himself as the husband of his people. He has chosen us as his spouse, as his bride. And it would be a strange marriage if the married couple rarely lived together. Or if they did live together, that they never demonstrated any affection or any interest in one another. Nothing could be more intolerable than a marriage partnership without any affectionate communion. The old Puritan Thomas Brooks, and I think of all the Puritans, Thomas Brooks is my favorite. And he says this, the more any man loves Christ, the more he delights to be with Christ. Lovers love to be alone. Now, I trust that you'll begin to see the point that I'm making. Communion and closeness to Christ is the fundamental relationship between the, the believer and the Savior. And our truest happiness is to be found walking in nearness to Him. And outside of heaven, there is no sense of heaven apart from nearness to Christ. That fellowship that we have with Christ is the outer court of the New Jerusalem, which ultimately is heaven itself. It was Martin Luther who said, a dungeon with Christ is a throne. A throne without Christ is a hell. So we must strive to maintain that which is our fundamental relationship as a result of our regeneration and our new birth. So that statement, he restores my soul, reminds us of something else. Not only of our fundamental relationship with the shepherd, but then it reminds us of our most frequent sin, which is committed by his sheep. 
What is the most frequent sin? It's a reminder to us of just how often we stray from Him and we wander far away. There are foolish decisions or decisions made foolishly because it is basic to our sinful human nature to act foolishly and like sheep to go astray. Isaiah, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And like sheep, we continue to go astray. And sheep, perhaps more than any other animal, is prone to wander astray. And that is true of the sheep of Christ's flock. Otherwise, there would be no need for us to be restored or to be brought back. One of the commentators says this, sheep are prone to wander. And the farther they proceed, the more they are bewildered and the more unlikely to return. Alas, the resemblance is too exact. Christians, although renewed in the spirit of their mind, carry about with them in the remnant of corruption a principle of departure from the living God. Take away the influence of His grace, and the work is done. The most enlightened believer goes astray at the next moment. How far the regenerated may go is not for us to conjecture, and it would be madness to try. That they shall not finally perish is one of the plainest promises of the Bible. But between the circumspection of grace and the damnation of hell, there is ample room for sinning and for chastisement. Lost attainment, forfeited joy, withering graces, barrenness, leanness, lameness, and a long train of miseries follow the steps of disobedience. Now, I believe that that's what we need to consider as we're listening to what David is saying he restores my soul. And whilst the statement is in the present tense, David is referring to the past, to the present, and to the future. He restores my soul. He has done it. He has often done it. He is doing it now, and he will continue to do it. Now, he's not referring here to the religious hypocrite who's made a profession of faith and doesn't possess the reality. And it's very important to remember this. There are people who say that they are Christians, and when you look at them and their Christianity seems to hang loosely upon them, the Christianity that they have seems to rely simply by attending church on a Sunday, occasionally attending some kind of special service. They keep a Bible somewhere in the house and they carry it with them and they come to church, but that's about all. Prayer is simply a formality to them. Praise seems to be foreign to them. Private Bible reading, if it does take place, seems to be a drudge to them. And with those kind of people, we are forced to ask the question, not are they out of communion with Christ, but have they ever been in communion with Christ? And we have to be honest as pastors and say that our hearts go out to these people. They're engaging in the duties of religion without enjoying the blessings of it. And they can be in our churches every week, starving spiritually when all the provisions of the gospel are there within their grasp. And they're like hired servants and not sons. They have the name, but they don't have the nature or the reality. And that is why such people are never satisfied with the worship that they attend. And very often they feel that the worship is dull, and so they're craving novelties and amusements in order to attract them and in order to keep them. Now, if you heard about a child that was always going to the corner shop for sweets and crisps and chocolates and so on, then you might conclude when you looked at that child that the food at home wasn't good enough for them. However, you might discover that the food at home is very good food but they simply refuse to eat it. Why? Because they have no appetite for such things. And that's why they're constantly going for the other things in the corner shop. And if a person is not truly in Christ, it's no wonder that they want to be fed on all kinds of other amusements. They'll be attracted by the crisps and the sweets and the chocolates, or put it into Old Testament terms, they have no taste for the heavenly manna, so they will crave the leeks and the garlic of Egypt. And salvation has a different aspect to those people who don't enjoy it. 
in contrast to those people who do. And those of us who are pastors, we can often see it within the church of Christ. You have some professing people, and they don't have the real thing, and they have no joy or happiness in the Lord, and yet alongside of them, there are others who are basking in the sunshine of God's grace, enjoying everything that is going on. But the psalmist here is not speaking about unbelievers. He is speaking about true sheep. He is speaking about those experiences that they go through when they depart from the pathway, they stray from the shepherd, and they lose their communion with him. And that can happen in a number of different ways. One of the most frequent ways that it happens is by neglect of the Word of God and times of private prayer. And of course, we're back to the basics, aren't we? And we all know, and we ought to know, that communion with God is the one vital, indispensable thing that we need to cultivate in our lives. So the neglect of that will involve spiritual declension, and it will involve spiritual wandering. Another way in which our going out of the way is by unconfessed sin. On the purely human level, If you have a disagreement with somebody, it doesn't matter how trivial it is, if it's between you and your wife or your friends, there is a coldness, there is a restraint, there is a distance that takes place between you. And so you keep apart from one another. And that can only be remedied when the wrongs are righted and when the misunderstandings are explained. On a purely human level, we all need to learn how to keep short accounts with other people. We were thinking of Alan Gardner, the great missionary to Patagonia this afternoon, had a misunderstanding with his father and left the family home, little realizing that he would never see his father again and couldn't put it right. The same thing happened to the great missionary Henry Martin. As he is sailing out to India, and he had a misunderstanding with his father, and he never had the opportunity to put it right. Keep short accounts with other people. And keep short accounts with God. As soon as you are convicted of sin, confess your sin and put it right with the Lord. Because when we sin, very often, we become like Adam and Eve in the garden, and we distance ourselves from God. And the very thought of fellowship with God became an unwelcome thought. And unconfessed sin casts a shadow across your fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you don't pray as you used to pray, and you neglect your Bible, and you don't have the same relish for the means of grace. And so the world and the flesh and the devil are all working against you, and each of them and all of them can lead you astray. And then if we don't guard our company, before you know it, you can be drawn aside from the right path. The little children, wasn't it wonderful to see these children today sitting here, listening to that children's story? But those of us who are older children, listen to what was said. Mr. Flattery, Mr. Atheist, can easily draw you away from the right path. Pride, selfish ambition can lead you astray. Pastors can be full of pride. They can walk into the pulpit with a strut and enjoy the applause of men. And if you want to be cut down to earth, read Richard Baxter's Reformed Pastor, and that will rid you of your pride. But pride can take you out of the way of God, and it's led many people astray. Envy and jealousy, a spirit of discontentment, David remembered his sins against Uriah, his adultery against Bathsheba. How did that happen? How did that happen to David of all people? 
that he should commit murder and adultery. Well, you know how it happened. He had time on his hands. He had an idle moment. And the devil trapped him. And the devil enticed him. And young people, there are times when you will have opportunity and you don't have temptation. And there will be times when you will have temptation and you don't have the opportunity. But the devil will see to it that there will be times when temptation and opportunity come together. And that happened with David. And he's taken out of the pathway. How far he strayed from God at that particular time. And how often our sinning against God is because we have time on our hands. Oh, all right, dear, I'll, I'll be up to bed in a, in a few minutes. You just go ahead of me. And then you sit down there and you take the remote and then you start searching the channels. And before you know it, you're looking at things that you would never look at in front of your wife, but the Lord is watching. And you have time to maybe go on the computer, just spend half an hour on the computer. And the devil finds work for our idle hands. And we lose the sense of the presence of God because of our own stubborn willfulness. Sometimes because of our own anger or our resentment. Wasn't that the problem with Jonah? He didn't get his own way, so he wouldn't go God's way. And sometimes it's the neglect of a duty. Or we fail to speak up for the truth. Or we harbor evil thoughts. Or we dabble with things that we shouldn't dabble in. Or we get absorbed with things, good things in themselves, but things which can lead us astray. And we need to be reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ is a jealous lover. He is a jealous lover. He will not cast us off, but there are times when he will withdraw the smiling of his face. And he is the one who says to us, can two walk together except they are agreed? And how often we wander away, we neglect him, we seek out our own pleasures, our own interests, and he comes to us, and he needs to rebuke us or to chastise us, and he needs to restore our soul. So this wandering away seems to be one of the most prevalent of all our sins. And David is saying that we need to watch that continually. The Lord has to restore our soul. And sometimes it seems as if he's forever doing it because we are forever needing to be restored. And to ask yourself the question, am I a backslider, is never an idle question. Ask yourself the question, am I a backslider? So this statement, he restores my soul, reminds us of that fundamental relationship to Christ. It reminds us of our most frequent sin against Christ. And it reminds us of the glory of Christ as the Good Shepherd. And that glory is seen in a variety of ways. First of all, his glory is seen in his undying love for his own. He restores my soul for his namesake. Now, if he was like ourselves, this is something that he might not have done. But he's not like us. He is a pardoning God. He is a compassionate Savior. He loves us with a love that will not let us go. Now, there are some people whose doctrine is such that it implies that he will leave his straying sheep to themselves, and eventually he will leave them to perish. Apart from our doctrinal position, we could never go along with that kind of thinking because our experience teaches us otherwise. 
We have proved in our own lives as Christians that time and time again, having loved his own that were in the world, he loved them to the uttermost, or he showed them the full extent of his love. How does he do it? Because he comes after us and he restores our soul. And he has told us that nothing will pluck us from his hand. And so every believer here this evening, you can testify to the fact that he restores my soul. He is always doing it. He has never yet cast me off. He's never yet left me to myself. He's never yet abandoned me to my own devices. In love and in mercy, he has lifted me out of the mess of my own making. He's done it again and again. And he's done it so often that it seems to me as if he's always doing it. His love for his own sheep means that he will not let them go. He is the shepherd who leaves the ninety and nine in order to seek us and to save us and to bring us to himself in the first place. And having saved us at such a cost, he goes on seeking and saving us and restoring us again and again until we reach heaven at last. And after wandering away a hundred times, we might be tempted to think that he will say of us, as he said of Ephraim of old, Ephraim has turned to his idols, leave him alone. But he doesn't. And he restores us again. And our names are deeply engraved on the palms of his hands. He will not leave us to perish. We have cost him too dear for him to abandon us. And after restoring you a hundred times, he still restore you. Why? Why does he do it? What well, says David? For his name's sake. He doesn't do it primarily for your sake. He's doing it for his own name's sake. And we all know that there is nothing in us that would justify him restoring us and giving us a fresh start. It is always upon the basis of who he is and what he has done that he restores us. His own honor, his own glory are at stake in caring for his own sheep. Because if one saved soul might finally be lost, then his enemies would say that God forsakes his people. He began a work in them and he couldn't complete it but he restores our soul for his own namesake. How does he do that? Well, he does it by various means and in a variety of ways and often through different people. Sometimes it is the thunder of his law that comes to us and we've sinned against him. And then the law comes to us, smites us and points us back to Christ. Sometimes it is simply the wonders of his love. And we're overwhelmed that he could still love us. And that breaks us down. It may be a calamity. It may be a tragedy. It may be that he sends a violent storm after us as he did with Jonah. It is often by the incisive ministry of the word of God. As when Nathan came to David. And through the word of God our dead conscience can be awakened and aroused and we can be awoke from our slumber in a second. Isn't that what happened to Alan Gardner, those of you that were here? He simply received a letter from an elderly lady and in a moment, God spoke to him. Proverbs 23, 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. It may simply be a look of love. He looked at Peter. And it was that look which penetrated Peter's heart and mind. And how often Peter must have pondered this verse in David's psalm. He restores my soul. The Scots minister Reverend John McNeil relates a story of how a Christian man was restored from a state of doubt and a lack of assurance. And he says this, I remember a big stalwart of a man coming to the vestry after I had preached. Oh, Mr. McNeil, he said, I'm so miserable. I feel so dead. 
I'm no Christian. I was never truly converted. I'm only a hypocrite. He fairly groaned in his misery. Man, I said, if you were taking your last look now at all that's mortal of a dear friend before the lid was screwed down, how would you feel if your friend should suddenly stretch himself out in his coffin and groan out, oh, I feel so dead? When a dead man says he's dead, he's never so dead as he says he is. <laughs> I'll never forget how he laughed and the darkness went off his big strong face like the mists lifting off Bren Kruachan. The dead don't mourn their deadness. Now, it may be just a word in season like that that can restore you. It may be just a handshake. It may be just an invitation. And God, by various means, and through various means, restores our soul. And sometimes it takes time for that to happen. There is a little booklet, I don't know whether it's out of print now, by a woman named Mary Jones. Mary Jones and her husband were farming people in Wales. They were very close friends of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He went there every year to spend a vacation with them. And um, they lived on a, a sheep farm in Wales. And she has this little book, booklet called In the Shadow of Aaron. Aaron is a mountain near their home. And she says this, I heard of a shepherd in this district whose mountain pasture lands included one very rocky part. During one very severe storm of wind and snow, his sheep were swept to the edge of a very rocky, rocky precipice. Soon, great drifts of snow blocked their way back over the mountaintop, and before them yawned the precipice. The shepherd knew that the only hope of saving them lay in the young shepherd boy going behind the flock and driving them very slowly and carefully along the narrow strip between the snowdrift and the precipice. Meanwhile, he himself would stand on the rocky edge of the drop to keep the sheep from going over. He knew that if they were to panic and rush and push against him as they went by, he could well lose his balance and be hurled headlong onto the rocks below. What was the compulsion behind this brave act? In spite of careful shepherding and the best possible feeding, sheep are thoughtless creatures, and they are slow enough to show any appreciation, in contrast to the horse or a dog, for instance. Why then does the shepherd battle on and, preserve, and persevere in spite of seeing no manifestation or acknowledgement or gratitude? He is a son of the soil, true to his stock. He loves his own. That's the secret. He loves his own. Having loved his own, he loved them to the uttermost. Do you remember that statement in the upper room? Looking at these men, having loved his own, he loved them to the uttermost. He showed them the full extent of his love. I've mentioned this story before. Some of you told me that you remember me hearing it, remember hearing me say it. I had an occasion a number of years ago to have to go and see an elderly lady in a nursing home in Liverpool. I was living in Glasgow. I only had one day in which to do it, so I had to drive 200 miles there and 200 miles back in the same day. And when I got to the nursing home, I went in to see the lady and she was there, she didn't recognize me, she was simply sitting there. And I sat with her, combed her hair, I cleaned her fingernails, I helped to feed her, give her a drink. And anybody walking past the room, looking in and asking questions would wonder why would somebody travel 200 miles there to sit with this lady who couldn't respond, and then to go back 200 miles, why would they do it? They would probably say they wouldn't do that, and they wouldn't. But I did it because that was my mother. That was my own. She was the one that raised me. She was a single mother. She worked her fingers to the bone to keep her family together. And if I had to do it every day of my life, I would have done it because she was my own. And you will do for your own what you will not do for anybody else. 
And here our Lord is looking at His people, and He's saying, they are my own. And having loved His own, He showed them the full extent of His love, and He went down on His knees, and He washed their feet. And He could have looked up at them and said, I'll not only wash your feet, I'll die for you, because you're my own. And that's why He restores your soul, because you are His own. And of course, he loves all of his sheep equally, but there are times when he shows a particular love for some of his sheep. And he shows that when they wander astray. You think of any mother or father in any family, they love their children equally. But if one child is ill, or if one child is in trouble, or if one child has gone away to college, Their love and their affection at that time is concentrated on that child. And the true shepherd has a loving concern for those who are lost and those who have gone astray. That is one of the glories of the Lord Jesus Christ. And His glory is seen in the initiative that He takes on behalf of His sheep. Look for a moment at Psalm 6. Do you remember that was read before uh, to us? It's commonly known as one of the first penitential psalms. And as our brother read it, you would get the sense of it. It's the cry of a soul who is under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And David is trembling under a deep sense of the divine displeasure. And he says that the terrors of hell have taken hold of him. And that psalm is not exaggerated language. It is true to experience. When you sin and you lose a sense of the presence of God, it is by no means an easy thing to recover that. Somebody made mention of Bunyan's holy war. Remember the point where the city of Mansoul, they had to wait for a long time for Emmanuel to return after he had been grieved away. And yes, it is true that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But who can guarantee that you can have genuine confession after you have sinned? The fact of the matter is that you have no assurance that you shall want to forsake your sin or be able to forsake your sin whenever you like. Because repentance is something that God gives to His children. He restores my soul. It's not tears that are the critical thing. It is turning. And God forgives the past. But it must be past. That's the point. And I'm sure if David was in this pulpit that he would emphasize and stress the personal pronoun. He restores my soul. And all your renewals and all your revivals and all your retrievals and all your confession of sin come as a result of his initiative. He was the one who saved you in the first place. He looked upon you when you were lying like that fondling, foundling child in Ezekiel 19, lying in your blood, and when people passed by, they said, no, I pitied you, says the Lord. But He pitied us, and He came to us, and He washed us, and He clothed us with garments, and He made us comely. That's what He did for us in our salvation. When we were like Lazarus in the tomb of our own corruptions, here was the Lord who came and told us to come out. And He called us, and He quickened us, and He saved us. And the one who called us and quickened us and saved us is the one who restores us and brings us back into communion with Himself, where we enthrone Him once again in our lives so that when I become proud or stubborn or petulant or lazy, and when I refuse to pray, and oh yes, there are times when we do, how often I've gone into my study and there is the prayer chair. And I know I should be down on my knees at the prayer chair, or I should be praying in the prayer chair. But then I've got other things to do. I've got emails to see to and things like that. And what do I do? I deliberately turn away and the chair is empty. 
And we can easily lose the sense of his presence. That central factor in our lives. And that is the thing that needs to be restored. And he does it in various ways. Do you remember Naomi in the book of Ruth? We were thinking about her earlier. She returned to Bethlehem and all the gossips in the village. Is this Naomi? Is this Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she said. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. And she was full. She was full of a sense of her own importance. She was full of her own opinions. Still showing that tendency when she's doing all the ordering of Ruth, planning Ruth's connections with Boaz. But what happened? The Lord humbled her. And then he brought her home again. And he restored her soul. And sometimes when he needs to bring us back into that communion and that peace with God, he has to deal with us. And we need a sense of conviction because we've sinned and departed from him. And sometimes we begin to fear the consequences of our wandering. And it may reach the point where you fear, fear that you're not even saved. And then the pangs of conviction begin to work. And sometimes the pangs of conviction in our restoration can be greater than the pangs of conviction that led to our salvation. But the remedy is the very same. As he brought us to the place of Calvary when we were saved, that's where he brings us when we are restored. And it's there at the foot of the cross that you experience the sense of relief and pardon for your sins. And what do you discover? You discover as Jonah discovered. Do you remember that wonderful statement in the book of Jonah? The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. He is the God of the second chance. And he's the God of the third chance and the God of the fourth chance. Where would any of us be were he not the God of the second chance? And he brings us back and we're astonished at his patience and his compassion and his forgiveness. And then your heart is touched and then the tears begin to flow. And you want to get rid of the things that charmed you and the things that took you away. And then Jesus becomes more precious than he was ever before. And sometimes we have more affection for Christ then than we did before time. After he has restored us, we see the glory of Christ. Listen to Mary Jones again. She speaks of a situation where a sheep has wandered over the edge of a cliff and it can't return. And she's speaking about their own personal experiences, her husband as a shepherd. And she says, it is far easier to come down the rock face than to climb back up. She, that is the sheep, had stranded herself on the rock ledge where there is no room to go backwards or forwards. The rock face behind and the precipice in front, here she must stay in spite of all her efforts to save herself. Will anyone see her? She may be there for days before her owner passes by and is able to free her. When the shepherd first sees her, he makes no effort to reach her. He does no more than to cast a keen glance in her direction, yet his glance is full of compassion. The following day, again, he may well pass that way and still do nothing about rescuing her. And so the poor little sheep is left there to starve. A few days later, the shepherd resumes again, and by this time, the sheep has grown so weak and desperate that she has begun to bleat as though her heart would break, calling out persistently for help. The shepherd has been waiting until now to hear that bleat. He knows that this is his opportunity to reach her. 
If he had gone to her aid before she began to bleat, she would still have had some strength to do something for herself, and in fear at seeing him approach, she would have leapt to her death in the chasm below. But now her pathetic bleating assures the shepherd that she is at his mercy. Get the point? Our foolish wanderings. And we can get ourselves into a situation like that sheep. And we may feel that the Lord is very slow at coming, but he's waiting to hear that bleat. He's waiting to hear that crack in your voice that tells him that you are looking entirely to him alone and that you are absolutely serious and you are absolutely desperate. And God never is before his time, and he never is behind. Isn't it true that we can exclude God from our minds at the very time when we need him most? There can be an intensity of sorrow or grief. Do you not find that sometimes your soul becomes inverted and turned in upon itself and you begin to brood upon your own misery and there is a strange, perverse pleasure in turning the knife in the wound and recounting all the tokens of your misery to yourself. And that's a great temptation. And we need to refuse the luxury of self-pity. If sin and shame is there in your heart, look up to him. Don't look at yourself. Ask him for his forgiveness. Ask him to restore you to what you were before you fell. And he not only restore your soul, he is a God who restores the years that the locust has eaten. And how many times in the midst of bitter darkness there comes this sudden flash of light and we realize that God has answered our cry. Your circumstances... The interesting thing about Psalm 6, David's circumstances were still the same at the end of the psalm as they were at the beginning. His circumstances had not changed, but everything at the end of the psalm is different from what it was at the beginning because God has broken through into his soul and God has revealed himself to David. And the change has come in David's heart and life. And very often the remedy for our wayward souls has been that God has come to us. And just by coming to us, everything is seen in a different light. And when he comes to us, he comes and he says, Now, there you are, my child. Abide in me. Keep close to me. In Scotland, and, in Scotland, and you'll find in Northern Ireland, social life begins at 10 o'clock at night. You go from somebody's home, go from church, go to the, their home, and uh, everything comes alive at night. You, you have a large meal at about 11 o'clock at night, and then when you're tired and you're wanting to go home, sometimes they say, well, just bide a while. Just bide a while. Stay. And Christ comes to us, and he says, bide a while. Not just a while, but abide in me. And the best remedy for our wandering astray is Christ himself, Jehovah Rophi, the Lord that heals you. And our greatest need in times of spiritual declension is to come back to him. He's the only one who can restore your soul. Now look at the latter part of the verse as we close. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. And the idea here is that sheep and people often think that the straight path is the easy path, and very often it is just the reverse. And the shepherd often leads them in the winding, meandering way. But that is often the safest and the best way. He leads me. The same verb that is found in Psalm 73 
you will guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. And it's focusing upon this whole matter of guidance in the Christian life. So here is David reviewing his life, everything that's happened to him, overwhelmed by the goodness and mercy and grace of God toward him. And he's saying all the way, the Lord has led me and guided me in the paths of righteousness. Now, not every path in life can be described as the path of righteousness. There is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It is possible to be utterly sincere in the way that you seem to be going in life, but you're still going in the wrong way. We were going to the coffee farm yesterday. We thought we were on the right road, but we were going the wrong way. We were doing it in utter sincerity. We thought we were on the right road. And you can be going in the, in the opposite direction that you should be going to, and you're doing it in all sincerity and in all ignorance, but you're going the wrong way. It is possible to be utterly sincere in the things that you do and still to be wrong. It is not in man to direct his steps. Having become a true Christian, our life from then on must be kept in the paths of righteousness, the way of holiness, the way of uprightness in your dealing with God and in your dealing with other people. And that is the way which God chooses for his people. He guides us in the paths of righteousness. And he doesn't simply do it for our benefit. He is doing it for the ultimate reason, which is for his own name's sake. He has placed his whole glory upon doing this. His glory as the Son of God. His glory as the Redeemer and the Mediator of his people are vitally linked in what he is doing here. He is restoring us and leading us in the paths of righteousness for his own namesake. That is why he does it. That which moves God to save and to restore his people is to be found in him and not to be found in them. There is nothing in you and there is nothing in me we are worthless, we are helpless, we are nothing. It is all of God, and it is all of grace. And every blessing you receive comes from the God of goodness. And even in the midst of his troubles, when he's surrounded by his enemies, David realizes that the Lord was over everything that happens to him in this life. He recognizes that God was sovereign over all things. And this sovereign God was with him in all things. And these are extremely important truths and wonderful aspects of the Christian message. If you translate these things into New Testament terms, what this means is that in Christ's death and resurrection, you are given a new standing and you are placed in a new position. And we are brought into the straight and narrow path, which in essence is the path of righteousness. And it is that that enables you to go forward and to engage in the aggressive warfare with the enemy of our souls. And you are able to wield the sword of the spirit, spirit, which is the word of God. Now, it's not fanciful to read New Testament truths into this psalm. I believe that's a valid use for the Christian to use the Psalter. The whole of the Bible is written for our learning and for our comfort. So whatever else we learn from the psalm, surely we can see that to David, God was the most important reality in his life. He was a living reality. And for some people, the last thing they seem to do is to call upon God when they need him. And they'll go to others, they'll go to this one, that one, the other. Why? Because God is not that reality. But David said, yes, he's a reality to me. And he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. And you can go through David's life when he was a shepherd boy. He had this realization of the presence of God. When he was chosen by Samuel, he was the least in the family. They didn't even bother to call him in to meet Samuel. When he went to take provisions to his brothers. And here is Goliath. Who is this man, he says. And here is this young stripling of a lad. And he goes out and defeats Goliath. He led me in the paths of righteousness. God was a reality to him. In the cave of Adullam, God was a reality to him. In the palace of Saul, God was a reality to him. Throughout the whole of his life, he is saying, he has led me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Why? Because he is the good shepherd.
How shall I close? Look to him. Keep close to him. Abide in him. And make sure that you keep in the path of righteousness. Read the book of Proverbs. And look at the two ways that are set before you. And Solomon is saying to his child, My son, this is the way of wisdom. This is the way of foolishness. Choose wisdom. Seek for the wisdom of God in his word as if you were looking for hidden treasure. If I were to say to you, somebody's been going around America and they've just come to the United Kingdom, I don't know whether you've read this in the news, this uh, man who's extremely wealthy, and he's been leaving packets of money everywhere. And he's just been pasting little clues where you'll find this money. People are searching all over New York and opening packets of hundreds of dollars. If I were to say to you, and you were to believe me, out in the prayer garden, I have buried a hundred thousand rand. And if you go and have a look, you may be able to find it. Well, if you really believe me, you'd go. <laughs> and you wouldn't sit here for very long. You'd be out there and seek for it as you would seek for hidden treasure. And as you would seek for gold, be determined. That's the message, that you are going to keep close to Christ with determination. And yes, we do wander and stray, but yes, he is the God of the second chance. And so when he gives us that second chance again and again, keep close to him. And yes, there are mysteries in God's providence and things that could knock you off your balance and things that happen to you as a Christian and you begin to question what God is doing and then you realize that the secret things belong to the Lord our God and the things that are revealed belong to us but there are secret things, things that we can't explain and you look at the state of the church and you look at all the confusion and you say, what is God doing? When I first went to the city of Glasgow, I'll close with this. When I went to the city of Glasgow for the first time as a student in 1962, I think it was, and um, in the center of Glasgow, it was, it was before Glasgow became a smokeless city, so all the buildings were thick black soot all over these sandstone buildings. It's a large, beautiful library the Mitchell Library in the middle of Glasgow. It's black as soot. And then one day we passed and here is this huge scaffolding all around the, li the, the library. And over the scaffolding there was all kinds of tarpaulin. And then week after week as you passed the library, there was this tremendous noise. Noise of drills and everything going on. You're saying, what on earth is happening? What's going on under there? And then one day, the scaffolding came down. And the tarpaulin had been removed. And the building was standing there in its pristine glory. That is a pale picture of the Church of Christ. We look at it today and we say, what is happening? What is going on? But God is doing something. And one day there will be a great unveiling and you will see his church, his bride, in all her beauty and her glory. And we will say, what marvelous things God has done. And on that day, you will say, the Lord is my shepherd. He restored my soul. Let's bow together in prayer. Our gracious God and our heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are and for all that you have done for us and for our salvation. And we bless you and we praise you. 
that our Lord Jesus Christ is like the hound of heaven who chases us down the years and will not let us go. And we thank you for those times when you have come to us and restored us. And you have not cast us off. And you have not cast us into hell because you have loved us with an everlasting love. And we bow before you and we give to you our heart's adoration and praise and thanksgiving. And we do it all in our Savior's lovely name. Amen.